so just real quickly, folks, uh, if you'd like my phone number to reach out, um, if you don't want to, you know, ask any questions or anything, um, it's posted there on the screen along with my email. And kind of down there at the bottom uh, is our uh, social media or our Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube channel. You can find all that stuff at TAMU Livestock Guard Dog. So, and that will come up back up again at the end if you if you miss that stuff right now. So, um, how do livestock guardian dogs work, or or how do they control predators? So basically, there's three ways. Um, that there there's territorial exclusion, there's disruption, and then there's direct confrontation. And so the the main way that the dogs really work is the first one. And although the last one, the direct confrontation, is what gets all the, um, you know, social media posts and pictures online and videos on YouTube and, and that kind of thing. But that one really is a very small portion um, of how the dogs work. And so uh, with, with the first one, the territorial exclusion, basically the dogs go around on a, on a regular basis and they scent mark the territory. And you know, a, a good working dog um, should remain close with the herd and, you know, from time to time, go out to the territory perimeter, scent market, patrol the pasture, and then come back. Um, one thing that, that differs with guard dogs over, say, llamas and donkeys is that your livestock guarding dogs will work as a team. And they generally work things out amongst themselves. Um, I'm not quite sure how they they decide, you know, who's going to do what. But, you know, usually you'll have a dog that stays with the herd and then another dog that'll kind of float or maybe be out on the perimeter. And then they'll switch from time to time. Um, it's just something in in the canine behavior that they they do. And so that's territorial exclusion. Uh, disruption is, is basically with the barking. And sometimes, you know, if you have close neighbors, that can be an issue. And, and so if you do have close neighbors, I, I would, you know, kind of encourage you to pick a, a livestock guardian dog breed that doesn't necessarily bark as much as some of the others. Um, and so the barking is generally kind of in the early morning, you know, late evening and, uh, you know, kind of generally throughout the night. And, and really the idea with that that the dogs are doing is they're just kind of letting predators know, hey, you know, I'm here on guard. This is my territory. You know, if, if you decide to come through, um, you know, then there'll be some aggressive posturing. You know, the dogs will be growling more, barking, running up and down the fence lines, um, that type of thing. And the last, the direct confrontation, you know, they will chase away threats. And, you know, if they can catch them, you know, like at the corner where, where two fences come together, um, most of the time, you know, the dogs will kill whatever the threat is. Uh, but that's generally, you know, that is really pretty rare instance. I, I know I get people all the time that say, well, you know, my dog has killed 20 coyotes this year or whatever. But uh, again, that's really a rare instance. Um, and that's really not what you want with the livestock guardian dog. Um, they are supposed to be a non-lethal method of, of predator control. So um, we have some questions today. And uh, I'll kind of as we go through, um, oh, I, I think they're going to post those questions to you, or you might already have them. And so, uh, oh, that was one of our, our, our question topics today. Um, do, do, so, do, do you want the first question already? Yes, yeah, sir. That was one of the first questions we had right there. Okay. Okay, over there. The people start answering. I think this is a great idea that y'all have. I've never had anybody do a, and I've never done a, a poll thing like this. So, um, yeah, okay. I think that that's pretty neat. So, over there, you can see the the results of the people is not sleeping. They are listening to you. Okay. Well, good. Yes, everybody. Most people got it right. Um, yes. So, how do livestock guardian dogs control predators? Um, it should have been D, all of the above. It's the territorial exclusion, the disruption of, of the pattern of the predators, and then the direct confrontation. So um, looks like everybody's paying attention so far. We'll see if everybody has, has good scores as we, as we get through this thing. Okay, go ahead. 
So um, basically what we're going to go over is we're going to kind of look at some best management practices today. So we're going to look at how to choose a livestock guardian dog. Um, I'll give you some information about bonding them, raising them properly, feeding, uh, kind of matching the dog to, to your ranch or, or farm scenario. Talk to you a little bit about spaying and neutering, uh, stocking rate, knowing some of the specific behaviors of livestock guardian dogs. Uh, how to help the dogs be successful at, at your operation, and then why it's important to, to share some information about the dogs to folks. So, so choosing a livestock guardian dog, um, you know, we strongly recommend that you only use breeds or crossbreeds um, that are recognized as livestock guardian dogs. Um, so basically what you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a a guardian dog that's mixed with something else. So for instance, like a German Shepherd or um, a Border Collie or, you know, um, some other type uh, of dog. And, and the reason is because what happens is livestock guardian dogs have been bred for thousands of years not to have what's called prey drive. And so prey drive are, are natural instincts that are in wild canines that allow them to, to survive. And so Prey driver things like um, eyeing animals, stalking, chasing, um, biting, killing. And so over time, humans, ha as humans domesticated dogs, um, we have increased the tendency of some of those things in certain breeds and decreased the tendencies of, of those prey drive instincts in other breeds. And so as soon as you um, breed a non livestock guardian dog, to a livestock guardian dog breed, you have now reintroduced prey drive instincts back into that dog. And, and so when you put the dog out, then the dog doesn't know, well, am I supposed to, to herd these livestock? Am I supposed to protect these livestock? And so what ends up happening is you end up having animals that are injured or killed because the dog that you have guarding um, doesn't know that that's what they're supposed to do. And so a, a good example is like the picture that's on your screen over here. Um, hopefully everybody can see that dog. But, um, you know, a livestock guardian dog should not have ticking. Okay, and if you're not familiar with what ticking is, is you can kind of see on the legs of this dog and on its chest, the, the little brown, you know, kind of spots intermixed with the white. Uh, th there's not a livestock guardian dog breed that's out there that has ticking. And so this dog, um, a producer had contacted me and we were kind of going back and forth about some different things and what was going on. And I was pretty convinced that they didn't have a legitimate livestock guardian dog, even though they swore that the person they bought it from said, oh, no, no, you know, it, it's 100% it's livestock guardian dog. Well, like I said, livestock guardian dogs shouldn't have ticking. And so that was why this producer was having a bunch of dead sheep. Um, next thing, you know, on choosing a dog, you really shouldn't choose dogs that are in the rescue. Um, I know that there's lots of guardian dogs that are in rescues out there and that it's a major issue, but there's a reason that those dogs are there. And so uh, unless you're going to have time to uh, do an awful lot of training and, and try to fix whatever is wrong with that livestock guardian dog, your best bet is just to buy a puppy and, and bond it and train it yourself. Um, because then you know what has and hasn't been done with that dog and whether it'll be safe with your livestock or not. Um, there are some very good rescues out there um that are that are doing that kind of retraining of the dogs uh but there's also also a lot of rescues who are just kind of a holding place for these dogs and they want to you know move them along as as fast as they can to somebody else and so um I, I would definitely discourage the use of rescue dogs for you um when you're picking puppies you know make sure that they're raised on a ranch in pens with livestock um that they come from actual working parents and that you get to see the parents before you purchase a puppy uh and, and you know this one's kind of a given but um you know I, i've had people like purchase dogs that maybe weren't as healthy as they should have been. And then they contact me about it. And um, so I, I just put it in presentations anymore. Like, you know, make sure that you're buying a healthy dog. If there's anything that you question, you know, if the dog looks extremely thin or has a big pot belly or has a lot of fleas or, 
you know, has runny eyes or runny nose or any of that kind of stuff. I don't care what the breeder tells you, you know, there's some health issues with that dog and you, you, you need to be aware of that before you bring it home. Okay. Um, also, our recommendation is to wait until, you know, eight weeks of age to, to purchase a puppy. Um, a, a lot of female dogs will, will wean their pups earlier, especially working dogs. And, you know, what we've found is that by waiting until eight weeks to, to get a dog, which is kind of the generally accepted time, uh, th those puppies really need those extra couple weeks to learn canine social skills. Um, puppies that we've gotten at eight weeks, um, you know, by the time they become adults, we don't have issues like a lot of folks do um, with, with aggression issues between dogs. And that's because those puppy they learned as puppies how to get along with other canines that they're they're with. And so it's important to, to get a puppy at, at eight weeks of age, okay? Don't, don't get them any younger than that. Um, if you don't have facilities to train or you don't have time to train a puppy, um, you can consider getting an older, what's called a bonded pup um, or a yearling dog, but just know that you are gonna pay quite a bit more for those dogs and, and they're harder to find um, because breeders have to put more time and money into them. And, and so they, they generally charge more for it. Um, you know, if you're getting into livestock guardian dogs uh, for the first time, I would highly recommend just starting with one, two dogs at the most, uh, because as we'll get into here, there's a lot of issues that come up um, when these dogs are going through adolescence. And so if you've got more than two of them, you're going to have an awful lot of issues all at the same time um, that you're going to have to try to correct. So bonding. Um, bonding is really crucial to livestock guardian dogs, and it needs to happen at a specific time in that puppy's brain development stage um, to, to form the best bond and the strongest bond, um, you know, to, to kind of guarantee the success of, of that dog. And so, um, you know, when these dogs first came over from Europe in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, I'm not sure why, but it was kind of thought that you, you know, the dog should have no human contact whatsoever. And so we definitely do not recommend that. Um, you know, and then on the opposite side of that, we don't recommend full human contact either. You know, these are a working dog and, and they have a job to do for you. And, and so they're not a pet. Um, so what we do at the center and what we recommend for folks is, is limited human contact. And, and it doesn't take a lot of time to do this, to keep to have a well socialized dog as an adult. We socialize dogs for 10 to 15 minutes, three to four times a week. Um, when we do that, we leash train the dogs. We tether train the dogs. Um, they get a truck or a ride in a trailer. Um, sometimes it's just by themselves. Other times it's with livestock. Uh, long haired dogs get some grooming and, and we teach some basic commands to them during that time. Um, by just doing that short amount of, of socialization and, and training, um, if you continue that through the bonding process and, and continue that on through a, adulthood of the dogs, you'll be able to get a dog that, you know, when, when it's out working in the pasture, um, that you'll be able to call and, and the dog will come over to you and you'll be able to handle the dog without having any issues. Um, a, a big thing where people get into to issues with the whole bonding process and socializing the dogs is that, you know, uh, kind of like what my, my boss likes to say is, you know, what you permit with livestock guardian dogs, you promote with them. And, and that's very true. And so, you know, if the puppy gets out of a pen where it's supposed to be during the bonding time and it shows up at your house or at your ranch headquarters, um, you know, you, you need to take it back immediately. Um, if you pet the dog and you're nice to it and, um, you know, you, you feed it or if you put it into a kennel with some of your other working dogs or hunting dogs, you know, that dog is going to continue to come back to that area. And then you're going to have more and more of an issue uh, as time goes on. And so don't reward the dogs away from livestock is basically what we're trying to get to. Feed them in contact with livestock. Give them all positive reinforcement when they're in contact um, with livestock, you know, and, and a good deterrent, if they're doing something bad or they show up at the back porch or at your house or something like that, um, 
Oh, uh, like an air horn for, for boats works great. Um, you know, obviously just yelling at the dogs. Um, if you have small puppies growling because dogs understand that a growl means to stop doing something. Um, and again, that kind of goes along with that, you know, eight weeks of age, um, you know, purchasing puppies at the right time. So how do we bond the dogs? Um, so basically what we do, and you don't have to follow the exact same size of what we do. What I, what I hope that y'all get from this is, is the process more than anything else. Okay, so don't get hung up that, you know, we have, a, that we, you know, you have to have like a 60 by 60 pen because you don't. Okay, these are just the sizes of the pens and, and pastures that we have, but it's the overall idea of, of what I'm going to talk to you about here that, that's important. Okay, so the first couple months that you have a puppy, um, our dogs go into a 60 by 60 pen, and inside that pen, um, they're either a single pup or a pair of pups. Um, because that's what we're testing. And then we're also testing hot wire in the pens versus non-hot wire in the bonding pens. And so inside of each, each pen, there, there's four to six head of livestock. And, you know, I never know where, where our dogs are going to end up um, as, a, as a yearling and then as an adult. And so we have a multiple species in the bonding pen each time. So we have uh, wool sheep, hair sheep, uh, meat goats and angora goats, okay? And, and so because those are the predominant breeds in our area that we're sending dogs out to producers that have those. Um, it's also really important that you rotate the livestock every two to three weeks. And the, the idea behind that is so that um, the, the dogs don't form a bond to specific animals, right? They, they form a bond to species, um, because if you don't do that and you don't rotate the animals out on a regular basis, what will happen is at some point you'll have to, to cull animals. We, we all do, or animals die. And what will happen is you'll have a, a dog that's been great, might be three or four or five years old, and then all of a sudden that dog starts to roam. Okay, well, that's because, you know, most often that people didn't rotate the livestock out of the bonding pens. And so those dogs bond to specific animals and then you get rid of the animals and then the dog goes searching for them. Okay. So it's really important that you rotate the livestock in your bonding pens. Um, at, uh, oh, three months of age, our dogs go into a larger pen. Um, that's one acre in size. Uh, we also, you know, try to change the ages of the animals at that point. We're continuing to rotate them. Um, our dogs start off using a feeding station, but if you're going to move to having a feeding station, this is the time um, to, to probably start doing that. And then uh, at six months of age, you know, they need to go out to a larger pen or, or what's called a small trap. Um, something generally 25 to the maximum of probably 75 acres. Um, our pastures are a little bit bigger than that. Um, and it's not quite ideal for our situation, but we just haven't had the funds to, to put in some more fencing to, to make them a little bit smaller. But that would be my recommendation to you. Also, at that point, you know, they can join other dogs. Um, you definitely should have more animals at that point. And, uh, you know, if you're coming into a lambing or kidding season during that age, you know, you definitely need to provide some extra close supervision to make sure that there isn't any um, rough play going on uh, kind of during that time. So these are what this is kind of our bonding pen set up real quick. Uh, you can see that it's just woven wire. There is a strand of bob wire at the top, and there's one at the bottom here. Um, these also have there's a feeding station that you can kind of see where I'm moving my cursor in the background. Uh, there's a livestock shelter, also a shelter for the dogs. And uh, this particular pen, you can kind of see a solar charger um, oh, up here on top of the fence. And so it you can't really tell because all the brush, but there's a there's another fence line that's just back here, and then it kind of makes an L shape over to this corner um, in each one of the pens, and that's that 60 by 60 area that I mentioned earlier. So our bonding pens, because we're both we're bonding multiple dogs um, every year, um, they're inside 100 acre pastures. These are those pastures that I mentioned, and so they're roughly about a quarter of a mile apart this way, and then they're about a half a mile apart. Um, between the next pasture um, oh, to these pens that are down here. Uh, again, you don't have to have the dogs in, in a setup like this. Just 
it's understanding the process and moving dogs from smaller pens to gradually larger pens with more animals and more livestock and all that kind of thing over time. Um, it's really important that you establish boundaries and that your dogs respect a fence. Um, that's one of the things that we've found in, in the four rounds of the bonding project that we've gone through to date. The dogs that have been bonded in pens with hot wire and then had invisible fence after they left the um, bonding pens are not leaving as adults. It, it's basically, I don't have exact statistical numbers for you, but it's roughly about one or two times per quarter that the, the puppies that were bonded in hot wire will, will leave a pasture. And when they do, it's generally, you know, they, they leave and then they come back. Versus dogs that are not bonded in hot wire and don't have respect for fencing, uh, those dogs are leaving multiple times a week, and often they're not returning to their home pastures. Those ranchers are having to go get those dogs, or more often than not, it's myself or um, a student assistant that's having to go pick up those dogs and bring them back to the ranch where they're supposed to belong. So, um, you know, I strongly encourage you to use some hot wire. Um, also an invisible fence system once the dogs get out of the bonding pens to teach them respect um, for fencing uh, until they get to be adult dogs. So I mentioned adolescence, and, and I generally refer to it kind of as the teenage months. And if you're a parent, um, you definitely understand, you know, what, a, what happens when you have a teenage um, child. But you know, this is when most of the issues come up with livestock guardian dogs, and it generally runs from about eight to roughly about 18 months of age. And, you know, there's a little bit of leeway on each side. So it can happen as young as six months and it can last until 24 months. Um, it really just kind of depends on the dog and on, on the breed of dog. Um, so it, it's important that you don't leave, you know, teenage or adolescent dogs, you know, with young stock in pens. Um, that's really a, a recipe for disaster in your bonding pens. Um, we had that happen accidentally in um, oh, around five dogs. Uh, a bunch of my bonding animals got bred because a pasture with some rams and billies, there was a hole in the fence. And so we didn't know that they got bred. And so we had lambs and kids. And um, so we had some issues with that. So, um, you know, make sure that they're they're not around young lambs or kids because they will chew on ears and chew tails off and um, chew on legs of young lambs and kids and that kind of thing. And so one thing that, that does help if you're if you need two dogs and you're having to bond them because you only have one pen, for instance, and you're having to bond pairs is you can bond the dogs as pairs. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, the issue becomes when they start to go through adolescence that you need to separate those two dogs um, and keep them as far apart as possible until they get out of adolescence. Because otherwise what happens is they feed off of each other's um, behaviors and, you know, you can have lots of um, lambs or kids injured because of, of rough play from um, adolescent dogs. And, and they're not purposely trying to go out and, and eat your animals. Um, you know, generally what happens is it starts kind of with chasing and then it becomes biting and then they grab and then they hold. And then, you know, um, livestock guarding dogs have a hard mouth. Um, for those that are kind of familiar with like hunting dogs that have a, a softer mouth, um, you want a livestock guarding dog grab something, they grab it very hard. And the idea is for them to grab it. So they, you know, they hold whatever it is and Generally, they kill it because that's what their job is. And so, um, you know, that's why a lot of times you'll see them eating dead lambs or kids because they're they're cleaning up um, oh, dead animals, you know, after birth, all that kind of stuff to keep scavengers and, and predators from coming into the area. <clears throat> so some ways to avoid, you know, or, or correct this rough play. Um, so again, rough play is kind of chewing on ears or tails. It'll be things like carrying around young lambs or kids in their mouth, um, biting, chasing, uh, combinations of all these things together. And so you really need to try to catch them in the act and, and, and discipline them. Um, and it's not just, you know, like, you know, no, Susie, don't do that. I mean, you need to be very stern with your, your voice. It needs to be a very strong no. Um, and, you know, you probably need to swat them on the butt really good. 
Um, it doesn't take a whole lot usually to to teach guardian dogs not to to do something or that something that they're doing is wrong um, if you correct them uh, properly. Now, there's other things that you can do. Um, you know, to kind of decrease some of this stuff from happening. So I, I mentioned, you know, rotating stock in the bonding pants. If the dogs are picking on specific animals, remove those animals from the training area. All right. Um, you can use a dangle stick, which is the, the picture of the dog up here in the corner. Um, that one's kind of an awful lightweight. I, I prefer to use a, like a piece of two by four generally, um, but that's a dangle stick. And um, basically what it does is it changes the dog's um, walking behavior or it, it just makes their legs sore as they try to run and, and it stops them from running when you're not around. Um, the, the, you can kind of see the picture of the lamb down here. Uh, you know, part of its ear has been chewed off. And again, that's a very common thing that you'll see uh, oh, with young animals and, and young livestock guardian dogs. So kind of switching to um, health stuff. And again, I guess the first thing I would say is check with your veterinarian. Okay. Again, these are things that, that we do that our vet recommends for us to do for our dogs. Your vet may not recommend these things, but um, as far as vaccinations, you, you should vaccinate your dog yearly or, or whatever your state's recommendation is for Texas. You know, um, it's state law to have dogs vaccinated for rabies every three years, but our vet actually recommends yearly because where our dogs predominantly are at, there, there's a high incident incidence of rabies in the um, oh, canine population. So like the coyotes and foxes and things like that, a lot of those animals will carry rabies where our guard dogs are at. And so our vet recommends yearly, re yearly vaccinations for it. Uh, the DHLPP is kind of like your, your standard, you know, distemper, parvo, um, parainfluenza shot. Um, the one thing that I want to caution you there is make sure that, you know, if, if you have a vet that's a, I guess I'd say kind of a town vet, uh, a lot of times they won't include the lepto in the vaccination um, for the puppies or the, the yearly vaccination for the dogs because it's not an issue generally for town dogs. But livestock guardian dogs are out you know, in the environment with wild animals at all times. And a lot of those animals carry lepto and, and it's really not that much more expensive. I think it's less than a dollar uh, a shot to have the lepto included. And so I, I would definitely recommend that you, you do that. Uh, the rattlesnake and the Lyme's disease um, vaccinations, again, that depends on your area. Uh, our vet recommends the rattlesnake vaccination. I know that there's conjecture on whether it works or not, but again, that's what our vet recommends, so that's what we'll continue to do and, until he says different. Uh, I do encourage you to, to ID chip your dog, and, and once you do that, to make sure that you um, keep the information updated uh, in the ID chip system. Um, because if you have the ID chip and you move and you don't update the information, then you won't be able to find your dog. Um, you know, uh, Quarterly or, or biannual deworming, again, based on whatever your, your vet recommends. Uh, same with heartworm. Our dogs don't get heartworm because the area that we're in is extremely dry and, and there's generally not enough water for mosquitoes to even hatch. Um, but if you if you is an issue in your area, uh, oh, our vet does recommend ProHeart 12 and, and dogs that go farther east in Texas, um, oh, they get that... <clears throat> Uh, medication. And, and ProHeart 12 is a shot, and it's once a year. And uh, it works really well. Um, you don't have to remember to give them the, you know, the chewable pill all the time and that type of thing. Uh, flea and tick control, again, um, I would recommend that year-round. You know, the product that we use is Brevecto. Um, we use the, the three-month version of it, um, mainly just because it's a, it's a labor-saving thing, and we don't have to give it as often. Um, if you have long haired dogs, you really should groom them quarterly. It's really important, um, especially for long haired guardian dogs that, you know, when, when they're blowing their coat out, um, in spring and fall, that you get all that dead hair out of them, um, regularly because their, their hair coat, they do have a double hair coat. 
And um, what happens if they have mats or a bunch of dead hair in their hair coat, it, it doesn't insulate them properly. So even during the summer months, um, you know, you never want to shear your dog. You, you can spot clip areas if you have, you know, a, a severe uh, mat. Um, or there's a bunch of seeds or, or burrs or something like that in a specific area. But um, even in the summertime, their, their long hair helps insulate them from the heat. And so if, if it's clogged with a bunch of dead hair, their, their coat can't do that for them. And they will overheat and they can um, oh, get heat stroke just like humans can. Okay. Um, we recommend, you know, weekly health checks of your dogs. Uh, it doesn't take very long. You know, you can do this as you feed them, if you're hand feeding or whenever you're going out to check livestock, um, you know, give your dogs a treat. And when they come over, you know, check their feet, check their dew claws. You know, a lot of your guardian dog breeds or mixes will have double dew claws in the rear. And um, those toes can grow or those toenails can grow really fast at times and it'll actually grow into the toe and then you'll you'll have, have a dog that ends up limping around and will be lame and most of the time what happens is the vet has to then remove that toe and so you're gonna have an extra vet bill so check those kind of things um, check their eyes their coat um, and and also do a body condition score and so um you know i think i've got the next slide yes here we go so um Body condition scoring is really important because people always ask me like, well, you know, what type of feed should I feed my guard dog and how much and protein content and fat content and all those kind of things. And I'll talk about some of that stuff here in a minute. But, um, you know, not everybody can afford to, to feed $80 bags of ProPlan, for instance. You know, some folks are just starting out or maybe they just don't have the, the funds in general. And so they may have to feed something like just the traditional, you know, blue bag of Purina dog chow. Um, and so there, there's different calorie contents in all of your dog foods. And that's really what matters, not so much the, the ingredients, but the calorie content. Um, and, and so your dog should be in an ideal score of a, of a four to five. And, and just like with livestock, you know, you're going to kind of check over the ribs, check the spine, and, and you'll get better at it the more that you do it. Um, basically, what I try to tell producers is if, you know, if, if your dog comes up and, and you can see their ribs and you can just kind of see it, you know, in this dog here, um, oh, that's like a three. You know, if you can see their ribs starting to show, they don't have enough condition. And so you need to increase the amount of feed um, for your livestock guardian dog at, at that point. Um, so, and this score sheet is used by vets all over the nation. It's developed by Nestle, you, um, Purina. You can go on to their website and they have actual live dogs and a, and a really good video uh, that you can watch uh, on how to do it. And, you know, uh, like I said, a real dog in each one of these body condition scores so that you can kind of compare to your, to your dog that you have. So I think it's time for another question. Um, oh, we, we just uh, covered some information that uh, one of those questions was about. So uh, I'll go ahead and have you put up, uh, I think it's actually question number three. So I might be a little bit out of order here. Okay, the number three. Almost already, everybody. Okay, I think we got up. Oh, there was somebody else that a little bit of changes going on here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so do we have everybody? Any more guesses? <laughs> okay, well, for those of you that um, oh, selected B, yes, four to five. It is the proper body condition score for a livestock guardian dog. And, and honestly, for most dogs out there, okay? Um, you know, sometimes, again, this it, it, it depends on the individual dog. Um, I've had some livestock guardian dogs that just kind of based on their specific breeding and um, oh, kind of overall makeup, that they were very difficult to keep even in a, a body condition score of four. Um, 
you know, and these were some dogs from from round four of our bonding project. Um, they actually happen to be Akbosh in general. And, you know, the I worked with the producer a lot. And um, without just doing a whole bunch of extra supplemental feeding and um, kenneling the dogs from time to time, it was difficult to keep um, the, the two pups that he had from us even in a body condition score of four, they kind of generally just maintained a three and uh, that's where those dogs sat at and, and they're still out working today and, and the producer is super happy with them. So again, it really just kind of depends on your specific dog. And, um, but as a general idea, four to five is, is what you should shoot for um, kind of year round with your livestock guardian dog. So um, thanks everybody for, for keeping up with that one. Okay. So some feeding strategies for you. Um, you know, basically what our vet recommends um, is a high quality dog food, something that's in, you know, around 22% protein, around 17% fat um, with, you know, kind of a range either way there again. Uh, you know, animal protein of some sort should be your first ingredient. Okay. Um, now, the, the one thing that I want to mention there is that I get people ask me about feeding, you know, like an all raw diet or, um, you know, that they're making their own dog food at home and, and feeding their dogs. And, and I don't know who has honestly has time to do this kind of stuff, but apparently people do. Um, so what I would caution you if you're doing that or you're wanting to do that type of thing is two things. One, you know, commercial dog foods are, are properly balanced with vitamins and minerals, um, along with protein and, and carbohydrates and fats and all that kind of stuff um, that your dog is supposed to have. Okay. And so unless you're an actual nutritionist and specifically a canine nutritionist, uh, most likely whatever you're preparing at home is not meeting all those nutrient needs that your dog needs to, to do its job effectively. OK, and so um, I would encourage you to just feed a good quality commercial dog food. Also, um, domesticated dogs have a have a different nutrient set of nutrient needs than wild canines do. And and it's because we've domesticated dogs and they've become used to eating food scraps over time that we would give them. And so domesticated dogs actually need to have carbohydrates in their diet. And so that's why commercial dog foods have things like corn and wheat and, and uh, oh, barley and things like that in them because the dogs need those carbohydrates in their diet. And so if you're feeding nothing but a raw meat diet to your dog, again, they aren't getting the proper nutrients that they need to have. Okay. Um, so I think I've harped on you enough about that. But, you know, how much food should your guard dog get? Well, an adult dog is going to eat roughly two to three pounds um, per day per dog. So if you've got multiple dogs, you know, if you just kind of figure a good average of, you know, three pounds a day um, in their uh, self feeder, if that's what you, you know, choose to use, um, that should be adequate for the amount of time until you, you know, come back again and fill up their feeder. Now, um, ideally, you know, if you could hand feed your livestock guardian dog, that is the best choice. But most of the producers that I work with have extremely large ranches. You know, they have anywhere from 10 to um, 30 or more guard dogs. And so they can't go out and, and you know, hand feed all of their dogs every day. Um, a lot of times they don't see all of their dogs even in a week's time. And so what they use is some sort of a feeding station. Um, and a self feeder. So th this is just an inexpensive, um, you know, self feeder from Pet Lodge that we use. Um, I do make some improvements to it um, to kind of make them hold up a little bit better. And then they go inside a feeding station, kind of like this one um, that's down here on the bottom. Um, this particular one, we were trying out uh, an RFID dog door um, to to keep um, raccoons and everything else from from going inside the feeding station and, and it worked very well for the puppies in our bonding project um, but once we tried it out with dogs that were already on the ranches we had a lot of difficulty with that so if you're just starting and you don't have any guard dogs yet i would encourage you to to get something like this uh, to keep raccoons and possums and feral hogs and everything else um, out of your dog feeding station because like i said it it worked very well for us 
Um, there's nothing wrong with giving your guard dogs treats. Uh, I encourage our um, ranch hands to do that. It helps keep them um, well socialized for you so that you can catch them uh, should you need to do that. It also makes life a little bit easier, you know, if you're giving medication to the dogs because they've been injured or, or they're sick or, you know, kind of whatever uh, um, you need to do pill wise. So some different types of feeding stations. There's all kinds of things out there. Um, I just showed you one that we have. Uh, this one that's over here is, a, is another type. Um, basically, it's kind of the same design. Um, the, these stations that we have are very heavy duty, and they're roughly about four feet wide, uh, four feet high, and they're about six feet long. Um, it, it, they use uh, four by two welded wire all the way around the sides and then onto the gate here. And this one wasn't fully finished. We also put a piece across the top opening of the gate. And then um, we, we used these on one of the ranches and, and we just determined that since the feral hogs couldn't get into them, they, they figured out that they could burrow underneath. And so now we also have a floor um, inside our feeding station. But I'll give you some numbers on these feeding stations and what they've helped us do. But uh, this is one type of a feeding station. We like to have our dogs jump in. Um, I don't like our dogs to crawl under because for two reasons. One, eventually the hole that they crawl through gets large enough that, you know, livestock and other animals get inside there and start eating your expensive dog food. And two, I think it encourages them to go through a, a predator crawl or slide, you know, on a fence line. And that could lead to them getting caught in a snare, um, which is probably not going to be a good situation. Um, this one down here at the bottom is a kind of a copy from a producer of, of a wooden jump gate that we use at the center. Um, you can see that this one, you know, allows the dogs to kind of either go underneath the bottom or they can jump through and they just have some um, cheap panels, you know, kind of penned up or wired up to the side and, and their self feeder. This other one, the producer sent me a picture of a, a trailer design that they had. They had an old trailer that was originally used as a hunting blind. And so then they turned it into a dog feeding station and they pull it from pasture to pasture um, wherever they need to go with it. Um, if you're, you know, using dogs on, on larger property and you have multiple pastures and, and water locations, we do recommend putting a feeding station um, at each water site. Some livestock guardian dogs form such a strong bond with their animals that they will not leave them to go eat um, and they will basically starve to death. And so um, that's why we put feeding stations at water locations is so that, you know, when the livestock go to get water, which is generally once a day, the dogs can then go also get water, but they have food there available for them as well. And so, um, you know, again, it's important to have a, a feeding station at your water locations to keep your dogs uh, well fed and, and in proper condition. Um, we do try to mount them up off the ground. You can kind of see in this picture, this producer has it mounted up off the ground. It does help keep bugs and things like that out of it. Um, We've tried some different things with like insecticide ear tags and some pest strips and stuff like that to keep bugs and insects out of the, the feeders. Um, this coming summer, we're going to try, uh, um, I don't know why we hadn't thought of this sooner, to be honest with you, but um, we're going to try some diatomaceous earth. Um, it's worked well for me personally in, in a garden, and uh, I had some producers talking about it recently, and so uh, I think that'd be a good, good way to control some bugs. And, um, you know, if the dogs get it, um, it, it's not detrimental to their health. Um, you know, you, you can purchase food grade diatomaceous earth um, from local hardware stores, tractor supplies, that kind of thing. So this is a study, this original one that's over here um, was done in 2018 on, and we did a game camera study on what was eating, you know, the, the dog food. And so this big blue portion here, which is about 59%, uh, was feral hogs getting in there. And this orange section was the, the dogs getting in there only about 20% of the time. And then raccoons, 14%, birds, 4%, and then kind of sheep and goats with uh, smaller percentages. And so by changing to that um, kind of heavy-duty feeding station that I showed you a minute ago, um, 
last year in the early spring, um, we did another game camera study. We did it on three different ranches for a couple weeks at each um, location. And um, by having a different feeding station, we were able to completely eliminate feral hogs from getting in there. So now this big orange portion where the dogs getting in there about 42% of the time, no sheep or goats, uh, raccoons 32%, um, our skunk and possum percentages went up a little bit. And we've had an issue at one ranch um, with crows migrating through. And so our game camera study just happened to kind of be when the crows were migrating that time. And uh, so we did have a lot of issues with, with the uh, crows getting in there. And then at that same ranch, at one of the other locations that we were um, had game cameras, it was right next to a, a cement water trough. And so... Um, the trough wasn't working anymore, but the feeding station was up on the, on the slab. And so a fox was able to jump in there and, and eat a bunch of the dog food and then jump back out. And so that's why our, our fox percentage is a little bit high. Um, it's not so much that any of these other animals are eating more. It's just now that the hogs weren't in there, the percentages kind of change. But the idea here to, to kind of get from this slide is that by making some changes in your feeding station, you can keep... Um, non-target species like feral hogs um, out of them, and, and it makes a big difference in your, your feed use, okay? So here was one uh, same type of thing. We did a game camera study with timed feeders, and um, so a slide or two back, uh, there was a picture of a timed feeder. Um, by having a self feeder or a time feeder, it really didn't change the amount of times that livestock guardian dogs went in there. But it did drastically change the amount of food that we were losing to hogs, to raccoons, and to birds. Okay, so the blue is the self feeder and the red is the timed feeder. Um, one thing that we, we did discover after doing this, while it cut down on, on some of these non-target species from, from going in there and eating dog food, um, we did see some um, resource guarding start in dogs that um, didn't have an issue in the past. And so if you've got more than probably two or three dogs in a pasture, I would encourage you to then have a second timed feeder. Because what happens is even though you can set that to go off multiple times and, and different lengths of time to, to dispense feed, usually the dog that gets there first eats the majority of the food. And um, by the time the second and then third dog show up, um, you know, there's not much food, if any, left at all. And so then you kind of have to count on, well, you know, hopefully the livestock come back to water again in the afternoon. And, you know, maybe one of those other two dogs will get the food at that point. So um, while they do help, you know, reduce waste, um, you, you may need a secondary feeder at a different area um, of your water location so that the other dogs, um, you know, get enough food. So matching the dog to the to the scenario, um, you know, basically there, there's four or five breeds that are really common in the U.S. Um, there's a few more that are kind of getting more popular, but it, it's Great Pyrenees. Uh, those are the big kind of white fluffy dogs. Um, Anatolian Shepherds, which are the tan ones, they generally have some black on the muzzle and some black highlights. Akbosh, which is kind of like this dog that's in a picture here. They're a short haired breed from Turkey. And then Marema, um, again, they're a longer hair breed. They look a little different than the Pyrenees, but they are white. Um, they generally have kind of a longer snout to them um, than a great Pyrenees does. So, you know, most of your dogs, these breeds have tendencies, okay? But, you know, just because you pick, for instance, like a Marema, which is has the tendency for it to be a close in um, to the herd breed, it doesn't mean that if you buy one that that dog won't be out on the perimeter all the time okay so there are tendencies to these breeds of livestock guardian dogs but it's not a guarantee that the one that you buy will have that tendency right so that's why i go back to it's important to buy from a reputable breeder where you can see both you know the male and the female and that they're actual working dogs okay um the age of the dog is important uh, the size of your pastures, your brush density, uh, the type of fencing that you have, <clears throat> types of predators. Some livestock guardian dogs are better with specific predator types, okay, because that's the type of predator that they were, um, oh, 
you know, used against over in Europe. Okay. And so the type of livestock, some of your livestock, like for instance, um, Oh, your hair sheep versus your wool sheep. You know, the hair sheep tend to be more spread out in your pastures than your wool sheep do. And so you may need a different type of dog if, if that's the type of livestock that you have. Um, your proximity to neighbors, you know, how much contact the dogs are going to have with children, with hunters, you know, workers that come onto the ranch. Those are all things that you need to take into account when you're, you're trying to match the dog to your um, or the breed of dog to your ranching or, or farming scenario. Um, it's really important to spay or neuter your dogs. I can't stress that enough. Um, leave breeding of livestock guardian dogs to folks that, you know, know what they're doing. Okay. Um, that there's been multiple, um, research studies done, and there, there's no difference in guarding ability. I know that there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that, you know, like females tend to stay close to the herd and males tend to be perimeter dogs. We have not seen that in, in our study, and, and nor have any of the other studies that I've read um, seen that type of information. Now, it's not to say that there isn't a, a research study out there that I haven't seen, um, and that would, you know, uh, say different, but the ones that I have seen, that's what they've said. So um, I strongly encourage you to, you know, fix all your animals because otherwise what happens, um, one of the big issues, you know, so if you've bonded your dog properly and it was in hot wire, you know, because you don't want them roaming and then you don't get them fixed at the proper age and, and the roaming starts, um, all that work that you did to discourage that, you know, ha has just gone down the drain and, um, you know, they, they will roam to, to find a mate as soon as they um, become sexually mature. And it's it's oftentimes much younger than, you know, what we think. Uh, we've had female dogs come into heat as early as eight months of age. And, and I know about all the research out there. And I agree with it in part um, to wait as long as you can. But um, most of the time... Again, producers that we work with, you know, they can't wait until two years of age to to fix a livestock guardian dog. And so I've had several conversations with the vets at, at our vet school about this. And in their opinion, you know, um, and this is the recommendation that we follow at this point, is we fix all of our dogs between 10 and 11 months of age. Um, they've reached, they've almost reached full mature size by that point. Um, which is the reason why that you don't want to spay or new to them too early. And, you know, if there's going to be some sort of a, a genetic defect, um, like, you know, hip or elbow dysplasia, you're going to see it at that point in time. If you don't see it, most likely it's not going to occur after getting them fixed at, at that age. And so that's what we've been doing. And we haven't seen any issues because of that. So um, that's generally what we recommend to producers. Uh, usually, you know, most of your females come into heat after that. And your males haven't quite, you know, figured out, um, oh, to, to go and start looking for mates themselves. And so you can avoid um, roaming from starting a lot of times um, by getting that done. So dog stocking rate. Um, you know, how many dogs do you need? So our general recommendation is to start with one to two dogs per 100 head or, or one dog for 50 head and kind of increase from there based on your predation levels. And so the, the number of dogs really depends on, um, oh, your, your predator load, the, the terrain that you have, again, the size of your pastures. You know, I, I have, I work with producers that have pastures anywhere from, you know, 400 acres on a regular basis to, to 1,500 acres in, in one pasture. Um, and, and so if, if you haven't been to West Texas, you kind of don't understand why the pastures are that big. Um, but th there's just really nothing out there for livestock to eat. And that's why it's a, a predominantly a sheep and goat area, because it's a lot of brush and things like that. And sheep and goats do well there. Um, but you need very large ranches to accommodate, um, you know, not necessarily a whole lot of animals. Um, again, your flocking characteristic, you know, the, the type of animals you've got, whether you've got sheep or goats. And, and a big one on your stocking rate is your management style. Um, I, I've been working with one producer for, gosh, I guess three years now. Um, he started out, he had sheep scattered across the ranch. Um, he didn't have a set, um, oh, like breeding schedule. 
and he was just getting eaten up by by predators and so i convinced him to go to you know a set breeding time and the the best i could do as far as you know the livestock being scattered out was to to bunch them up into three different groups uh, of a little over 500 head in each one and um so he went along like that for a couple years, and then just recently this year now, he's decided that, you know, what we told him three years ago was right. He needs to put all the sheep into one big group and rotate them more often through all of his pastures. Um, because even though he's had guard dogs, uh, his lambing percentage is still not what, you know, it probably should be. And so, um, you know, those are things that you've got to deal with, and that affects how many dogs that you need to have. Because the more condensed that your livestock are, especially during like lambing or kidding season, you know, you really need to have all your livestock in the same pasture. Um, you know, while your your sheep and goats are, are lambing or kidding, it just increases your chance of success with your guard dogs to keep predators away. Um, once you know they've lambed or kidded, and and those. Um, young animals are, are big enough to kind of run and and get away from predators um, then you can you know spread them back out a little bit more um so i think it's time again for for one of our questions um oh this is uh question number four okay so we'll see if everybody's been paying attention again uh, yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting your presentation. Thank you. It was all okay. Okay. Well, um, again, you know, our, our general recommendation, the one to two per hundred head. Um for those of you that selected B, that is the, the correct answer, okay? Um, you, you generally don't need more than that. Um, you know, the, the two to three dogs per 50 head, um, you know, that's not our general recommendation. Now, some producers may need to have that many if you have a severe predator problem or if you have a lot of large predators like wolves, um, you may have to change your, you know, dog stocking ratio to, to more animals. But um, again, generally what we recommend to start off with is one to two dogs per hundred head and, and kind of make adjustments from there. So um, thank you everybody for answering that question. So knowing some guard dog behaviors. Um, oh, things that you really need to kind of know, you know, when you're getting into guard dogs is that um, you know, during adolescence, they're going to harass livestock and they're going to, you know, chew on ears and chew on tails and stuff. They will eat, um, you know, after birth. Um, they'll even try to consume, you know, like if you have a nanny that dies or, or you that dies, they will do the best that they can to, to consume that whole thing. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh my God, you know, my dog's eating dead animals, but that's what they've been bred to do. They, 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 have that instinct bred into them at this point to, like I said earlier, to keep scavengers and stuff like that away from your, the rest of your, your herd. Um, we do a lot of stuff with GPS trackers. And so, you know, based on our tracker data, <clears throat> we looked at, um, it was about a year and a half worth of data um, on seven different dogs that were on a ranch that was about 5,000 acres. And so those dogs traveled an average of four, or excuse me, they traveled um, over that time between four and, and 12 miles a day. And the average, um, oh, that they traveled in a day was approximately seven miles. So, you know, a lot of people ask, well, you know, why did you do that? Why is that number important? Well, I go back to feeding with that one, okay? If you've got a guard dog that's traveling on average, seven miles a day, that dog needs to have a good quality dog food. And so if you're feeding stuff from Walmart, like Old Roy or something, and your dog isn't doing well, well, that's this is why, okay? Because they're traveling constantly to keep predators away from your livestock, right? Um, young dogs tend to chase deer and other wildlife. That they, they don't understand that deer or wild turkeys, you know, are not a threat to their animals. Um, and so, you know, 
they, they kind of it seems like they figure out that hey those deer are okay right around the the two two and a half year mark um with most of the dogs and by that point you know they just they leave them alone okay again the dogs are going to make perimeter you know, checks. They're going to go out and scent mark the territory. So they may not be with your livestock all the time. Um, they're slow to mature. You know, they are very intelligent and, and, and independent, but they don't like rapid change at all. And I, I think the reason dogs don't like change in, in their environment is because of, you know, how we've developed them over the years. Because you know, if everything is status quo in a, in a dog's environment, then there's no reason for them to, to get up and do anything. But if they see something different in their environment, um, they're very wary of that and they go to investigate it because it's not not the normal. And, and so, you know, if you're making changes, for instance, to like how you feed your dogs and the, like the door that they're jumping into or crawling into or however they're getting in their feeding station, Every time we make a change, we have to retrain those dogs to go into that feeding station again, because otherwise they'll literally starve, even though they smell the food and they know that they've been going in there. If that door is different in any way, you have to retrain them, okay, because they don't like change. And they do dig, um, especially young dogs will dig very big holes in your pastures, okay? Um, so... Anyway, um, so some things to kind of help them be successful, you know, use some other non-lethal methods in conjunction with your livestock guardian dog. So if you can do some shed lambing or night penning, um, you know, use, you know, good fencing, hot wire fencing, those type of things like that to, to help control predators um, as well as using livestock guardian dogs. Again, group them together whenever possible. I have a producer who swears by having a bell for every 25 head. Um, and I've had other producers tell me the same thing that, you know, when their dog hears the bells really active, they come back to the herd um, if they were away because generally there's a threat to, you know, the sheep or goats because the coyotes are, or bobcats are chasing them. Um, keep dogs with, you know, at-risk livestock. So again, when you're lambing or kidding, you know, try to keep all your dogs there, all your livestock in one place. You know, that area should be, you know, fairly free of brush um, and, and have the best fencing possible, you know, that, that you have on the ranch in those areas. Um, I already mentioned hot wire for the bonding pens. Um, make sure, you know, anytime there's a new event, um, you bring in new guard dogs to the mix. Um, that first lambing or kidding season, even the first breeding season or new species come onto your ranch. All those things, you need some extra supervision of your guard dogs because they'll be very wary of those other animals and they may keep them away from the rest of your herd. Even if you just introduce more sheep, you know, you go from 100 sheep to 150 sheep. Um, if you don't bond, rebond your dog to those new animals, they will keep them away from the original 100 um, sheep or goats or whatever it is um, that they were guarding because they don't see them as part of part of the herd. Um, sharing information with others is really important. Uh, a lot of folks that have ranching operations, um, you know, have hunting leases or they have family members that come out to their ranches that hunt, um, or neighbors, or they have staff. So make sure that everybody buys into the idea of having livestock guardian dogs and make sure they understand a lot of the information that I've given you today, um, on how the dogs act and what to expect from the dogs, you know, make sure they know, you know, if, you have hunters, for instance, on the ranch, you know, tell them not to pet the guard dogs, not definitely do not feed the guard, do guard dogs because they will come back and they'll bother them at camp or they'll, you know, um, sit underneath the hunting blind or next to the hunting blind. And, um, you know, you're going to have issues. So um, definitely inform everybody uh, how to interact with your guard dogs and, and kind of what to expect from them. The last one here. Um, you know, uh, the the signage and stuff like that, that really depends on, on your um, issues with liability. You know, all of our ranches and, and ranch properties have signs on them that, you know, say there's livestock guardian dogs out there, um, but that, that's kind of up to the individual person. Um, before I go any farther, uh, I had one last question. Uh, I believe that's question number two. If you wanted to throw that one up real quick.
Okay. So, folks, uh, uh, those that picked letter C, um, that is the correct answer. The average was seven miles, but the range was from four to, to 12 miles a day. Okay, so at least nobody picked eight. That, that, that was a good thing. So, um, for those that were paying attention, you got, you know, I give you at least some points, you know, on that question. So, um, well, I know we're probably over time here a little bit. I want to um, get to a little bit more information if I can. I, I mentioned that we use GPS trackers. Obviously, we just had that question. If you're looking for trackers, these are the ones that we use. Um, this Smart One C tracker up here is a satellite. Um, base tracker. Um, so if you don't have good cell service, um, this is one that you can use. It doesn't update very often, but it's better than not having a tracker on your dog at all. Um, the the other versions or trackers that we use are, are these down here, this black cased one. And these are the, either the Oyster 3 cellular version, which is just basically runs on, on cellular service. Um, so if you have good service, you know it works. If you have poor service, then it, then it probably doesn't. Or the LoRa version of this, um, which basically uses a um, a tower or a I say a tower, but it's really this box um, on top of either a tall pole or on top of a tower or an old windmill or something like that. Um, basically, this this unit up here at the top is, is like a repeater, and so the trackers send the signal to this repeater, and then it uses power to send the signal to the cell company. The nice thing about these units is that they're cheaper. We get much longer battery life of up to four to five months. Um, and the, the tracker is updating every 15 minutes. So it's taking a location and it's sending that location every 15 minutes. So you're probably thinking, well, gosh, why would I use anything else but that one? Well, the, the main issue with these LoRa trackers is that it's about a four to four and a half mile radius that this signal goes out. So if your dogs travel past that, or you have an extremely large ranch, you're going to need uh, another one of these gateway systems. Um, and so that, you know, there's a cost to these as well. Um, we use lots of game cameras, not only for, for studies, but just to see what dogs are doing out there. And so if you're you're new to guard dogs, I would encourage you to, you know, use game cameras in your bonding pens, by your feeding stations, um, to, you know, definitely kind of keep track of what's happening when you're not around. Um, I mentioned about the dogs traveling already. Um, this is just kind of a... Uh, a plot of a bunch of GPS data points that dogs were going. Um, you know, this is why it's important to have, you know, feeders at, at water stations. So each one of these spots, the green star and the red X, um, is a water location and a feeder. Okay. And so this one up here at the top, um, for whatever reason, the producer had the feeder over here. And so the dogs had to leave the water and kind of travel over to it. But, um, Anyway, that's just kind of that one. Um, I'll kind of go in quickly. Basically, again, this is GPS tracker data on, on goats to dogs and then dogs to dogs. Okay, the dogs to dogs, the red line, the, the blue is goat to dog. Basically, what we were looking at here is that the dogs follow the exact same movement patterns of your livestock. Okay, again, this was over about a year and a half's worth of, of GPS tracker data on, on these dogs at this particular ranch. And so even though they may be barking, you know, during these early morning hours, this is five, six o'clock in the morning, okay, four o'clock in the morning, they really aren't up and moving around as much, right? When the live, when sun comes up, you know, your livestock get up to start moving, so do your guard dogs, okay? In the middle of the day, they all take a break. Towards the afternoon, again, they start moving again, and then into the evening hours, everybody kind of starts slowing down, and, and, you know, the barking will happen, but they're really not up on patrol, like going out all the time and leaving the livestock. They're pretty much the same area the livestock are and moving just as your livestock move. Um, last, just a quick plug, um, there is Livestock Guardian Dog Insurance that's out there. It covers all the livestock guarding dog breeds and herding dog breeds. Uh, it's $100 for your first dog and then $25 for each additional one. Um, the reason I like to mention this for folks is not because we get any type of kickback from the insurance company, but it, it's really handy if your livestock guardian dog gets out and goes over and kills all the neighbor's chickens 
or they have some show sheep or show goats and they're not used to dogs and your guardian dog gets over there or your herding dog gets over there and some of those livestock die, this insurance will help cover you. Okay, so you do need to check to see because not all ranch insurances cover this type of, of issue, but this insurance definitely does. So um, if there's any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer those right now. Again, all my contact information, blog, our social media stuff is up there. So uh, I guess I'll just kind of go from there and, and get into the chat here. Yeah, please go to the chat. There are several questions, and also by the end, I I were just uh, making some announcement about the program also. Yeah, but there are some questions you want to go beyond and just. Want okay, so kind of scrolling back up to the top here. Um, this is from uh, Maurice Witt. Whitley, um, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, would you suggest a livestock guardian dog with a donkey in the herd? Um, I don't want the donkey to hurt hurt the dog. Um, so that's definitely you know a possibility. That's the way that donkeys and llamas work. Um, you know, llamas and donkeys are, are generally um, you know work well against canine predators because they are a prey animal. So uh, unless you're you know taking time to really acclimate your your guard dog to the donkey or or donkeys that are there um you know you can have issues and i and i see here somebody's posted that um they've had donkeys and and guard dogs together for over a decade and and they accept them while hating the herding dogs and again that 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 works um but you just have to be careful with the process, okay? Um, because otherwise your llamas or donkeys will go after your guard dogs if you haven't taken enough time to, to acclimate them well to each other. Um, oh, yes, yeah, some of the dogs will make short work of, of dangle sticks. Um, let's see what else here. Yeah, some guard dogs, especially like the Akbosh, because they have a lot of um, sight, what's called sight hound, um, way back in their breeding, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. Um, they just tend to stay on that super lean side. So they'll they'll be in that body condition three, and it's hard to get them, no matter what you feed, um, out of that. Um Um, so is it good to have a pond for drinking water? Um, I mean, if that's your only source, um, I would say there's probably nothing wrong with that. Um, I guess I can just kind of give you a brief history of an issue I had with my own livestock guardian dog one time. Um, while I did have water troughs for them to drink out of, um, I had a, a, a seasonal stream that would flow through the property. And there was one spot that the stream had eroded a lot and it would stay filled up with water. Um, pretty much all year round. And so a lot of times my livestock guardian dog would go down there and, and cool off in the pond and, and drink some of that water. Well, um, there ended up being a, an issue with the water and, and the dog contracted cryptosporidium. And so um, he got severely ill and, and we almost lost him. And so uh, if you can give him the choice of, you know, having fresh water and hopefully fairly clean water out of a trough, um, I, I would definitely give them, you know, that option. Okay, looks like the, the last question from Cass um, says, should you train two dogs at once or separate and individualize how far back to start retraining if bad behavior has occurred? So I guess I'll go with the first one. Um, you know, if you can do one dog at a time, that that's your best chance of success. Um, obviously, we have a project of looking at singles versus pairs and, and you know, we haven't seen a whole lot of issues in the bonding phase, okay, where the issues become when you're when you have pairs is really during those teenage adolescent months. 
And so that's when they really need to be separated. You can bond them at the same time, but once they get out of that bonding time, um, so say like around six months of age, um, you really need to separate them at that point if you can, um, and, and it'll just make life a little bit easier for you. And then how far back um, to start retraining if bad behavior has occurred? Um, boy, uh, that kind of, I guess it kind of depends. I mean, most of the time, the bad behavior starts with chasing and, and then it progresses from there. And then you get into, you know, biting and then there's usually like grabbing and then actual tearing of flesh and pulling of wool out, you know, tails being chewed off, ears being chewed off, all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you can stop the chasing from happening, that generally stops all the other stuff. Um, so, and, and as one person mentioned, yeah, sometimes you might have to use a piece of metal pipe. You just want to be careful that it's not too heavy. Like if you use a dangle stick, for instance, it shouldn't pull the dog's head down. You know, when you put it on, their head shouldn't drop. Okay. It needs to be light enough where, where they can move around still, um, but that it disrupts their, their movement pattern. And they get this kind of, I don't know, their, their front legs make this kind of circular motion as they walk. And um, it, it slows them down quite a bit. And it allows the lambs or kids to get away from them. And before somebody asks, um, no, this is not something that you should permanently leave on your dog. Um, it is a training device and needs to be used for short periods of time. Um, uh, we generally leave any training device on for a month. And then, you know, we take it off, see how the dog is for, for two or three days. If there's no bad behavior showing up like chasing, you know, that, then the problem is solved. Um, if it isn't, then we'll put it back on and leave it on for a month and, and kind of go from there. Um, we've never had to keep any type of different training device on a dog more than three months to date. Um, so that's why you need to catch these things fairly early. Um, so Helen wanted to know, can you bond dogs later? She has goats and um, want to get hair sheep. Dogs are a year old. Um, so yes, you can rebond dogs, um, Helen, but the um, the bond is not going to be as strong as if you would have done that from that five to to fourteen week window um, where the puppy's brain is developing, and and that's the proper time that it's it's forming those um, uh, associations with with different animals. Okay, and so yes, you can rebond dogs. Um, you know, and, and we you know, rebond dogs whenever we're moving them to a new herd um, or a new set of animals someplace, you really should put them in a, in a pen with some of those animals for, you know, 10 days or, or even 14 days. And what you're going to look for when you're trying to rebond dogs is one, the dogs aren't, you know, running, not so much chasing, but trying to, to catch the animals because the animals are running away from the, the dog because they're scared of the dog or vice versa, that the livestock are not chasing the dog itself. Um, you know, when you come up, the dog should be laying with the animals. Everybody should be calm. Nobody should get excited if the dog jumps up or if animals jump up for some reason. And, and also, you know, the dog, you should see the dog grooming the livestock, you know, licking their face, cleaning their body. Um, when you see that type of thing, you know, that, that dog is then bonded to that group of animals. Again, it won't be as strong if it was done as a puppy, but you can definitely do it later in life. Um, yes, yeah, so as Sherry mentioned, it's, it's good, you know, if you think you're going to have um, different species at some point, you know, so you've got sheep, for instance, and you're going to add goats and you're going to add cattle. If you're bonding a puppy, you really need to have those species in the bonding pen at the same time. Um, it just kind of helps guarantee your success later on, um, because sometimes what will happen is your dog won't accept that new species and they will keep them away from feed. They'll keep them away from water and they won't, you know, allow them to, to be accepted into the group or the rest of the herd of livestock that you have because they're a different species and the dog doesn't accept them. Oh boy, Helen, um, chicken magic. Well, I don't know if I have any chicken magic for you. Um, I'm not sure that guard dogs, uh, I've been talking with a, a couple fellow guard dog folks um, 
that have had dogs and used them for many, many years. None of us are really, you know, convinced that dogs actually bond to poultry. We kind of think they just grow to accept them. Um, and and so, you know, to probably guarantee you the most success with guard dogs or, or you know, attempting to bond or acclimating the dog, um, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of research done with it. But um, I would, one, start with a, an eight-week-old puppy. I would have that puppy in a pen inside of your chicken area. Um, and, and that way, that puppy is getting constant, you know, contact across the pen um, from those chickens. And, you know, the chickens may fly up on top of the pen. All that kind of thing would be good. Um, and, and just take everything really slowly. Um, you have to expect when you're trying to bond or acclimate guard dogs with any type of poultry that they're going to break some of the poultry, okay, and you're going to lose those birds. Um, so don't use your favorite chicken or your kids' show chickens or ducks or anything like that to try to, you know, bond your dog to poultry um, because guard dogs have a very hard mouth, like I said earlier, and when they grab something, they grab it hard and that generally breaks the chicken or the duck and um, then you got to go get a new one. So, um, you know, take everything slow, have the dog in there, have the dog on the leash a lot when you're out there, you know, say feeding the chickens or cleaning the chicken coop and, um you know, then work to where you're out there, but the dog isn't on a leash. And then eventually, you know, the dog is just in there, but well supervised, like when you're out doing some other, you know, chores around the ranch or farm and, and just take everything very slow is the biggest thing. Um, honestly, my recommendation would be to, um, oh, contact Joy Combs. Um, and her last name is spelled just C-O-M-B-S. Uh, she has Providence um, Farm in North Carolina. She has a ton of excellent information on guard dogs and poultry. And she also does an excellent presentation if y'all ever decide to do something like that um, about poultry. Uh, I've had her do some workshops for us on poultry and um, she's really good. She does a good job of keeping the audience entertained and, and providing some really valuable information too, so. Anyway, um, yes, if you have a good adult dog, they they will help you out, um, discipline puppies for sure. Um, you just have to watch out that, you know, if you don't have a good adult dog, they'll teach your, your new puppies the same bad behaviors they have as well. So, well, gentlemen, I don't I think that's it unless anybody else has any other questions. We're gonna stay. We're gonna stay here on the weekend with you. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, the rest of the day. Well, I'm sorry, it went over time you, you, there. You have, a you, know, you have a lot of information, uh, a lot of experience, and I like uh, that you're doing research. And so it's it's, it's amazing. So, uh, the, but uh, I I think this this was the the longest class, but everybody was so interested asking questions. Because generally, uh, like uh, when it's uh, one hour, I say, okay, we had to go for dinner, whatever. So, but uh, I think was so good. Thank you so much, um, Bill, for all your experience. So everybody is uh, happy to have you here. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much. I'm happy to, you know, to do do another one, uh, you know, this same sort of thing. Or if you all ever need a different topic or something, um, feel free to reach out. And, and folks that are still on, you know, if, if you need help, um, don't worry about not being in Texas. I, I, I'm happy to help you if I can. So. I'm good, good, good. Very good for, for your participation and for your offering the people to be uh, just, you know, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding and uh, a lot of uh, need of knowledge about all this. And we appreciate it very much. Okay. Okay, well, everyone, we are going to send an email informing you about the certification, the diploma, and our next uh, certification in person that will be during the summer at Cidalia, uh, during the last days of May. And uh, we keep in touch. So thank you so much, um, Bill, uh, Mohan, and uh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>